Hi, my name is Jen and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, I am very excited to bring to you an interview that I conducted with the YouTuber Tom Rousel of Survive the Jive. Tom is an historian, filmmaker, and also a practicing pagan. I think that this interview was very enjoyable, it was very interesting, and I learned some new things, and I hope that you will find this interesting too. <laughs> I'm not gonna make this intro super long. I'm going to say though that the video quality for this interview is not very good. Tom's video is going to be lagging all throughout, but the video or the audio is very good. There is no problem with the audio whatsoever. So I would treat this video more like a podcast or just uh, focus on the audio. Um, I'm very sorry that it was like this. I'm still very new to doing interviews, so I was very nervous uh, conducting this interview and also I'm not really sure what program is the best to use. I have used Google Hangouts before and this time I tried Discord. I like Discord a lot more, but um, I don't know if the video quality was due to the app, Discord app or what it was. But anyways, uh, let's just get into it. I hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome, Tom Rousel from Survive the Jive. Thanks for having me, Jen. Nice to be here. Tom is an historian and a filmmaker with his focus on European history, and he is also a practicing pagan. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thanks. Yeah, I just uh, had a live stream last night, so and that was with um, a Norwegian historian uh, about uh, discussing the recent Viking DNA paper. So that was quite fun, and I, I've been working on video about indo-european religion so i've uh, been busy but um yeah it's nice to be here and to talk to you nice sounds good um so i understand that you're interested in uh, european history uh, european culture and paganism that you want to share this interest uh, to get people excited and get people to understand the importance of these things that's exactly right yeah i um i'm a historian and i studied a uh, master's at UCL in medieval history and then went on to direct a f documentary film all about uh, Anglo-Saxon paganism and how it shaped the culture of the Anglo-Saxons even beyond into Christian times and then the, the whole foundations of the English nation uh, are to some extent rooted in that uh, ancient religion and uh, I think the same applies for every European nation they have these roots in these old pagan religions that even if you don't want to believe in them and uh, try and practice them, uh, you still uh, should be aware of that they existed and uh, they can inform uh, our sense of identity and our understanding of ourselves. Um, and I try to help people to un come to that kind of understanding through my channel, through the videos I make, which cover, you know, recent pagan histories such as like the vikings in scandinavia but also much much more ancient types of uh religious belief systems going from the roman times the ancient greek times and far back even to you know the neolithic uh the, the steppe cultures of the proto-indo-europeans and also the pre-indo-european cultures of neolithic europe like the kind of people who built stonehenge and stuff like that why do you think that these things are important to us today in our current world, in our modern world? Well, I think that there's the even the conception of the modern world is itself like the anomaly. There has never been a time when there these things weren't relevant. You can see, for example, here in Britain, uh, that Stonehenge and the surrounding monuments were which were built. Uh, I mean, the first the Stonehenge itself is finished off around just over four and a half thousand years ago and then a new group of people come build barrow mount barrow, burial mounds or barrows as we call them here all around it and those barrows also get reused for like hundreds of years and become integrated into local folklore as does stonehenge itself even in med you know the romans were aware of it in medieval times new myths ar arise around it so people start saying merlin built it merlin you know from the king arthur myth mm -hmm. And then other other and that like Merlin directed giants so that giants could build it for him. And then Christians start making their own myths about these stone circles, saying that Satan built it, or demons built them, or whatever. Uh, every different people has always had myths surrounding it, and even modern people, a lot of people will make their myths about these things because 
human m myth uh, is basically story. Mm -hmm. And the way that humans understand is with stories and narratives. And narratives and controlling narratives are the primary concern of people who have power now and has always been. Um, but these ancient narratives, ancient myths are very strong and powerful ways of understanding that link us with our ancestors and with the the entire history of, of humanity. Um, the idea of a break from that kind of traditional understanding is very recent and um, actually poses a threat of alienation. It alienates people from the land they live in. It alienates people from times preceding there so that they become atomized and uh, often there are all kinds of existential and psychological problems uh, posed by such a worldview which divorces mankind from his authentic existence which is should be within the context of his land and history okay so but but i think so there are current forces in the west trying to suppress the importance and our understanding of our history and our culture how do we um in your how do we what are the motivations for this is it just to like you say to control the narrative and how do we combat that well um the motives are very complicated and emerge from all kinds of different uh ideological currents converging in different ways in the early modern era in western europe uh, it comes, you know, from out of the Enlightenment, the, the whole kind of rationalism and scientism, and then the, the emergence, finally, of uh, Marxist materialism, um, the materialist conception of history, where people start to believe for the first time in the history of mankind is, that everything is nothing but a battle for material resources, mm -hmm. whereas all the diverse cultures in the past had had conceived of in ways, according to their cultures, of mankind as striving upwards to be something that he truly is, which tra it transcends his material circumstances. When when that's been divorced, and you have from when we were divorced from that conventional understanding of being, we entered a new phase, uh, which was immediately very violent and very uh, terrible things happened. Uh, across Europe and uh, and Asia, uh, namely communism and the millions and millions slaughtered in, in the name of it uh, in such a short time. Uh, but communism itself has also changed since, you know, the early 20th century a lot. And what has happened is that capitalism and Western liberalism, which were originally the antithesis, the, uh, the opposition of communism, have absorbed... Uh, parts of the the of marxist discourse and post-marxist discourse and uh there is no significant philosophical difference now uh in my opinion between what most people call left and right in popular mm -hmm. politics they're all conceiving of a struggle for resources and they they only differ and they also all are striving for a goal of uh, kind of like emancipation, like redemption of mankind from the sins of the past, the sins of history, and to be liberated from it. And they only differ on whether, you know, the forms of government that they think need to be uh, put in place to liberate mankind from these chains. Uh, so what they are doing when they, when they are trying to sometimes rewrite history or portray history in a certain way or... Uh, or is when they're trying to, it's the same thing as when they're trying to restructure our language, change the way we talk about the things in our lives, the way we talk about each other, the way we talk about gender and family and peoplehood, belonging. All these things are part of the same process, which is to redirect humanity because they believe, uh, which is a Maoist belief, it goes back to, which is that mankind is essentially a, a blank sheet, mm -hmm. which needs to be the mouse say you've got to paint that sheet red but um whatever they it, they might not necessarily will be maoists now but they all start with that premise mm -hmm. and they think you know as long as we pump everybody with enough programming then anything can be normal and if they perceive it as normal then they'll enjoy it so it's all morally justified and the end goal is to make a better world so literally any action can be justified in the pursuance of this 
uh, utopia, uh, however they perceive it. Um, so obviously I disagree with them because uh, they're wrong. For a start, mankind isn't a blank sheet. He's no. a, an organism with, with, with pre-programmed ways of being. And uh, part of uh, the experience of being uh, of mankind is to perceive oneself as a group, uh, part of a people. And that uh, corresponds not only to seeing other people who are alive, uh, but also who, who you identify as your own, but also, and perhaps more importantly, the countless dead who your ancestors, who make you who you are, uh, both in a spiritual sense, in a, in, a, in a transcendent metaphysical sense, but also in a, a more scientific and material sense, like you are, your cells are nothing but the, you know, the, the, yeah, exactly. the, the, the successful DNA of your ancestors that have been passed on. Mm-hmm. So cultural and national identity has always been very important. And now we are feeling that um, when when our cultural identity is very much torn from us, as we see today, we are filling that uh, void up with these superficial identity politics that we see today. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the idea is, I mean, especially, especially consumer capitalism, that all... Uh, needs can be fulfilled by the market mm -hmm. um, and so we are encouraged therefore to uh, alleviate any feelings of ennui or melancholy or whatever kind of existential crises we might uh, experience as uh, these atomized individuals divorced from the meaning that, is you, that mankind has conventionally derived from peoplehood and uh, belonging and uh, recognition of one's ancestors. Well, instead, you can just purchase things uh, and define yourself by those purchases. I am a goth. I wear these clothes because I'm a mm -hmm. goth or I'm a, a supporter of sports team or I am a, a whatever. I'm a, a, social, uh, I'm a socially aware eco-activist. These kinds of things, even when they are uh, portrayed as being rebellious in some way, they're often... They're often still can be boiled down to a few purchases you make the right you buy the right clothes or you you use the right um, you listen to this music or whatever so uh they they don't pose any threat to the actually established order even when they pur purport to be a threat of any kind but um the only thing that really goes against this kind of world system this world view of like these uh where, where, where people are, are forced to cling to these, you know, facile and meaningless fake identities is the traditional sense of identity that people all over the world still do have mm -hmm. and have always had, but uh, which is being uh, fought against by very powerful forces, uh, both in the private and the public sphere. What do you think is uh, the difference between historical or mythical archetypes and the modern idol worship that we see today, where we follow influencers, celebrities, and so on? Do you think that one is more or less harmful than uh, the other? Mm. Uh, I mean, I think it was um, the author of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe who said something about how uh, if you take away, you know, kings or gods people will worship they'll they'll fill their places with sportsmen or anything or pop stars and that's what happens we'll have fake idols um to use the the term i you know false idols is kind of a biblical term which i don't like because it betrays the um the failure of understanding that was uh quite uh widespread among early among the early church and among uh jews at the time uh who didn't understand european religion and what uh, uh what they call an idol which mm -hmm. what it is yeah uh, because they're thinking that they were unable to distinguish uh, a symbol from the thing that it symbolizes which isn't true uh, you can go to india and ask uh a hindu about whether they think that, that the statue of vishnu and Vishnu are indistinguishable. They understand that they're two different things. Uh, so it's a it's a straw man, uh, and I, uh, it's entered a you know uh, popular 
usage as an idiom, like uh, false idols. And I understand that um, when we're talking about it in the context of pop culture, then it, uh, it's valid in the sense that the the people that uh, are being idolized are not worthy of it. Like um, actors and musicians, I've got nothing against uh, them, uh, but they are not, it's not a healthy society which holds them up as the, you know, the the, the best, the, the most important people, society that everyone should follow and that should influence our children. They're just entertainers. It wasn't so long ago that uh, being an, actor or actress was pretty much the same level as being a prostitute. Mm -hmm. They were seen as quite low in society. And now that's been turned on its head. Um, the, uh, sorry, what was the rest of the question after the thing about idols? Uh, do you think that one is more or less harmful than the other? Well, obviously, um, I think that, yes, I mean, uh, one, are you saying one, one, one of which is more harmful? Sorry, I, and yeah, if, if, it, saying... if it's if it's uh, if um if the way that we yeah the difference between historical and mythical myth mythical archetypes if that if the way that we worshipped before yeah. was or was more or less harmful than the way that we worship um oh, our I see, idols I see, yes. today yeah but definitely which is definitely yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean how you basically can you answered take that already. The, yeah yeah sorry I, I I already covered but her you know someone like Hercules or or um, mythical heroes like Hercules, Achilles, uh, Sigurd, the dragon slayer, these are very positive archetypes. And um, when, you know, an Anglo-Saxon uh, mead hall where people were telling stories of ancient heroes like Ingeld or Beowulf or whatever, it linked them with their past. It reinforced the sense of community and also the values which their ancestors has held had held uh, and which they were held so that they are more conscious of their own value within their social structure and within the uh, the historical um, beliefs of the, that their people have held so that there was this um, harmony and uh, community uh, stretching through time and space within that uh, people. Uh, but that can't be provided by a footballer or a boxer. It can't be provided by uh, pop stars or whatever. They are just uh, distractions at, at best. Uh, if not, some in, in very often these t days, they're not merely mis distractions. They're actually uh, corrupting and subversive influence on the young. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, a feminist... Uh, very much enjoy history only when they can paint themselves as victims and martyrs. I would like to ask you, as an historian, do you think that our history is one of the constant oppression of women? No, I don't think that. Uh, I don't see anything uh, in history in terms of a, the dichotomy of oppressed and oppressor. I don't find that dichotomy useful. It's part of a narrative mm -hmm. which is Marxist. Uh, and it it is pre-Marxist in the sense that Christians used it as well. Uh, like you can see it, like, you know, that was sometimes justification for Christianity that they had been uh, oppressed under the Romans or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, it's mostly a Marxist thing. Like even Christian historians didn't tell every single history in this format, which we've become so used to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that it's hard for people to think outside it. We're, we're raised on American cartoons often and Hollywood movies. And every story usually has um, a protagonist who belongs to an oppressed group or and the antagonist who is part of a group who's trying to repress, oppress them. And the resolution is the, you know, resistance to the oppressor. It's such a cliched story. It's very boring. It's told in every single form. But they what's changed more recently in the last 10 years is that there have been with this whole concept of um, uh, of what well, what's it called inter intersectionality, mm -hmm. where they want to make more oppressed groups, more identity groups, uh, which you can more different made up groups you can identify with that are oppressed for X Y Z made up reason, and in so doing you cease to identify with your real 
um, you know, identity group, your your nation, your family, those kind of things that are authentic, uh, and and instead become part of this subversive momentum mm -hmm. uh, because they realized, well, Marx realized uh, certainly during, after the Second World War or even earlier that the so-called inevitable revolution of the proletariat was never going to happen, that the proles didn't have the revolutionary potential that Marx had believed they did, and that the uh, real revolutionary groups had to be like manufactured in, and they were going to be smaller and are very often comprising of bourgeois sort of people mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, with spare time to make up fake identities. But um, there, uh, yeah, th these, um, these things we're subjected to all the time, these kinds of narratives and stories. And perhaps even people who have openly spoken out against this tendency still aren't quite uh, realizing how much they have been influenced by this way of seeing. So that even people who oppose it will, will mostly be able to oppose it only in the context of claiming themselves to be yeah. an oppressed group at at the hands of left-wing oppression. Yes. So it's it's such a pervasive uh, viewpoint. I think that a lot of people are starting to realize that now, though, I think, because I've been thinking about that a lot recently because I see that a lot in Swedish culture right now, in Swedish politics, that, well, now the right wing is <laughs> the victims, like you say, of the leftist mm. rhetoric and, you know, we're, we cannot speak, you know, in certain rooms or whatever. And I don't think that that is very fruitful in just playing the victim game as it as it is. How do we how do we get away from yeah, that if it's so prevalent in our culture currently? Well, I suppose the start is to do what they what they did to get this way in the first place, which is to tell stories which don't rely on that dichotomy, where you don't have goody is oppressed, baddie is oppressor, and constantly putting it into that uh, this sort of format. You start to think of goodness uh, in relation to something other than victimhood. Mm -hmm. What it, it, we can start to think of what is the, um, Nietzsche had uh, tried to start to do that. I'm not entirely a Nietzschean myself, but I mean, he's an example of a philosopher who tried to think outside that paradigm that had already by his time become very powerful. And he foresaw that it was uh, a corrupting influence. He said, you know, what is powerful and um, what is good, that which ignites the feeling of power in man. And people hadn't talked like that in Europe for a couple of thousand years, or maybe a thousand years if you include Vikings. So it's um, it's something, uh, it's a start to th try and think about how we might think of what what is good. Uh, I mean, conventionally, we always have been able to rely on religion to know what is good. We can look to the Bible to tell us. And now in this post-Christian Western era, people aren't really sure what good is, and they even will question whether... Hold on. Sorry, am I back? Uh, you're back now. Yeah, I think some people would actually claim that even to say that there is an essential absolute good uh, in the platonic sense is evil because it's uh, absolutist and it uh, it doesn't leave, doesn't leave room for tolerance and pluralism. Uh, so that's a difficult, that's a very difficult starting point. Uh, I've got to get away from that mm -hmm. and... and more to a, a kind of uh, an agreement that good can exist and it doesn't depend on victimhood. Mm -hmm. Let's, I'm, I think I'm going to get back to that thought. But first, I want to ask you a little bit about the Indo-European topic that you talk quite a bit about on your channel. I want you to explain to someone who has no clue whatsoever, what is the Indo-European subject? That's a very broad well, question. Basically, <laughs> Well, that's a question I like to answer, so that's no problem. Uh, basically, Indo-European is a term used by linguists who study language. They were to, for a language group, and it's the largest language group in the entire world, and it spreads all the way from East Asia, like Bengal, uh, maybe even some, there's even further East influences among uh in, in Thailand and uh, Indonesia, which don't speak Indo-European languages, but have many Indo-European loan words. And all the way as far west as uh, Ireland with the Celtic languages and the Romance languages, everything, even English I'm speaking now is Indo-European mm -hmm. and all a, a lot of the languages of India. Uh, the reason it's called Indo-European is because when they named it, the 
the westernmost extremity of the language was Europe and the easternmost extremity was India. Uh, it was just, you know, to, to encompass that distance. Uh, it was first discovered by a British um, lawyer working in, uh, in India, and he had learned the ancient liturgical language of India, Sanskrit, as well as some uh, modern Indian languages, Urdu and Hindi, and realized that they were all related to European ancient languages like Greek and Latin. And that that could only be because, not because they were borrowing words from each other, which languages do all the time. Mm -hmm. For example, English has the word alcohol, which comes from Arabic. But we don't claim that English as a language comes from Arabic. But these languages were similar in a way that could only be because they all derived from one language. And subsequently, we realized that was in 1786. Now there's, we realized lots of other languages, Iranian, Polish, Russian, Spanish, or obviously all the languages that descend from Latin, all the languages that descend from Greek, all the Germanic languages, Swedish all, and English, all the Celtic languages, um, they all come from this one language. And people try to use the words of the language that they could reconstruct. They know like if they found a, lang a word that's in Russian in and another in English and ancient Greek and in Indian languages that are all related and mean the same thing, they can find out what that word would have been in that ancient language mm -hmm. and they could roughly start to reconstruct what the, when it was spoken and what kind of place it was. And then for hundreds of years, they were guessing what it was. And most people guess it was either Anatolia that they came from or from the other side of the Black Sea in Southern Russia and Ukraine. And those people, the latter camp have been proven right in the last five years. Uh, already that they were looking like they were proven right because archaeology was showing all the earliest uh, sort of horses were likely to come from there. And these, this language, uh, Proto-Indo-European, it's called, definitely had a lot of words relating to horses and wagons and wheeled vehicles. Mm -hmm. Like it's got a word for wheel, it's got a word for axle, and it's got words for horse. So uh, then they realize from archaeology, they got wagon burials there. And then they start to see the spread of a culture out of you know, uh, South Russia, Ukraine, into Kazakhstan, and then all across Europe, uh, right, you know, into Scandinavia and Britain, everywhere. Uh, and they're thinking that's probably likely. And then five years ago, massive DNA paper released groundbreaking as uh, where they start getting skeletons out the ground and testing them. And they find out that the languages that this this spread, this Proto-Indo-European language, wasn't just spread like, you know, like me passing a note. It was spread by people spreading it and uh subsequent papers have looked at more detail at that and it's not just that you know in some places like britain it's not just that a few people came and brought the language it's that an entire race came and replaced the previous races so it was an enormous event mm -hmm. that completely changed especially northern europe it changed southern europe linguistically because greek italian Latin, Spanish, you know, those are Indo-European languages. But Southern Europeans have more DNA still from the people who were there in the Neolithic. Mm -hmm. But Northern Europeans, like Swedes and English people, etc., have a lot more DNA from these invaders that came from South Russia, Ukraine, the Proto-Indo-Europeans. And a whole other school of uh, discipline has emerged of comparative mythology from scholars like Georges de Mazil and... Uh, Bruce Lincoln and uh, Jan Puvel have all, uh, oh, I've got his book right here. This one's very good, Comparative Mythology. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, they use the same strategy as linguists, but instead of doing it with languages, they did it with mythology. And they realized, and as well combined with languages, they realized that all these different religions, like the pagan religion of the Vikings, of the ancient Greeks, of the Romans, of the ancient Indians, that all comes also from one religion, which spread by these people, the Proto-Indo-Europeans, out of the steppes, uh, maybe 5,000, well, yeah, from like around 5,000 years ago, it starts to spread everywhere. Mm -hmm. Arrives in Britain around 4,500 years ago, arrives in uh, Scandinavia a little bit uh, earlier, I mean, like, arrives in Denmark a bit earlier and spreads into Scandinavia a bit later, uh, arrives in India, um, three and a half thousand years ago. So it's uh, an incredible story. And some uh, Victorian, very clever Victorian chaps in Germany and England mainly, 
uh, were leading the charge saying all this. They've been saying all that before there was DNA or archaeological evidence much. In fact, there's also one, um, to be fair, there's also a very clever Lithuanian woman, Maria Gimbutas, uh, who was um, who also has been uh, very important in the, in claiming that there was this people, it was a people spreading. And she explained it in a feminist narrative because she said they were the ones who brought patriarchy everywhere. And that pr <laughs> prior to them, there was all matriarchy and stuff. Of course. And she was... She was right in in a sense. She was right that they were patriarchal, and that she was right that they came from Russia, and they were associated with what she called the Kurgan culture, which is the burial mounds mm -hmm. in, in the in the steppes. So she was uh, she was very important in that sense, uh, and as were the um, uh, scholars who came before her. Uh, but that she has unfortunately she died before she could be realized she was vindicated about how much she was right about. She was wrong to say that everyone was matriarchal and worshipped only women before the Indo-Europeans. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she's still got a lot right, considering, you know, she was going on limited archaeological and linguistic evidence. And uh, I think it's fantastic that these Victorian and uh, early 20th century scholars have been vindicated after they were quite badly slandered for quite a long time in the mm -hmm. second half of the 20th century and beyond. It's been very, very unfashionable to talk about Indo-Europeans as a people because the idea of uh, conquering you know, race spreading its seed, you know, across the world uh, was considered very politically incorrect. Uh, and that it was just, they thought it was either a fantasy of the Nazis or a fantasy of the British Empire or a fantasy of some bad white people. But mm. now it's, it, no one can call it a fantasy anymore. It's 100% proven. And um, yeah, a lot of people have egg on their face for, for, for slandering these scholars. Would you say there's a growing interest in the European subject at large these days? Maybe because it has mm. so been so vindicated, or you mean the Indo-European subject? Yeah, the Indo-European subject. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, um, I think there was always a massive interest in it, but it was, it was getting to be like ten years ago, a little bit like fruitcake zone. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the people who were into it were a little bit weird, and <laughs> because it was because it was no longer acceptable in like normal academia to talk about those things as if like it was certainly a people um, you could only talk about it. I mean, in linguistics, it was still fine to talk about Indo-European because it was still accepted that Proto-Indo-European was a language, mm -hmm. but it was not accepted to say that this came from a people. And therefore I think comparative mythology was also a little bit suspect because for there to have been one religion, there might've been one people. I don't know. But the, um, the, I think the result of the last five years of genetic uh, revelations is that uh, Indo-European studies in all different respects, whether you talk about comparative mythology, genetics, archaeology, uh, and uh, linguistics is all now um, vindicated. And therefore, it's okay to, to be interested in this subject and to talk about it. And uh, it will, I, th I think it's going to be they're going to get more and more samples out the ground, more and more skeletons out the ground, and they're getting better and better at getting viable DNA from them and learning all about them. So questions that we ne most academics never thought would be conclusively answered have been answered, and more will be answered. So it's very, very exciting for archaeologists and historians who are just, you know, happy for new knowledge. But uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, perhaps a bit more... Uh, scary for people who don't like uh, essentialist narratives. Why is uh, the Indo-European heritage of particular interest returning to the topic of identity? Could it be the notion that it might serve as some sort of basis for a pan-European identity? And if so, might there be some risks and pitfalls with this? Um, yes, I think that um, the only people who tried to build an identity on Indo-European stuff before were not, were not the British scholars who pioneered it, but the, the Germans and the National Socialists. And they sort of based it on the claim that they were the purest, uh, the most, they had the most pure Aryan DNA. When they said Aryan, that's what they, they meant by proto-Indo-European, um, which they don't, um, but uh, they now we know they don't. But, uh, it, and I don't know if, um, 
it's obviously not necessary for, and I think the Nazis wanted a united Europe as well, but the EU project has gone ahead without any of that. So I don't think they needed uh, mm -hmm, yeah. that for, for that, for that uh, goal of a united Europe. It wasn't necessary. And um, uh, I don't think that the people who are interested in the Europeans are necessarily interested in it because they want a united Europe. Uh, and I don't think the people who are interested in the united Europe necessarily need to be interested in Indo-Europeans either. Uh, I can definitely understand why people of mixed European descent, particularly in the Americas, mm -hmm. might think that the Indo-Europeans are very interesting for that reason, because they're, they have this unique identity of being of European descent, where, rather than, uh, and you know, white, as we'd say, mm -hmm. rather than being just British or Swedish or whatever. Mm -hmm. And usually if someone in Britain is a quarter French or a quarter half Spanish, they'll generally just identify with the Britishness or and then eventually marry someone British and, you know, become the Spanish blood will just go away in a few generations and they'll just become British. But that won't happen in the melting pot of America where everybody's a mixture of German and Irish and English and whatever. So um, that that might be of use to them uh, in, in their modern identities. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, the, yeah. W what was the other part of the question? Sorry. You are... If there, yeah. If there might be some risk and pit pit pitfalls with using. Pitfalls. Yeah. Well, the, the problem is we can't, I'd say the risk is that because they, the Indo-Europeans themselves probably ceased to exist around four and a half thousand years ago. So they're like, between seven and four and a half thousand years ago, like that's quite a big time. We can imagine that people who are vaguely in this category of the early Indo-Europeans, late Indo-Europeans. And we don't know, besides like we can reconstruct bits of their language and we can say a bit about their social order and a bit about their um, religion and quite a lot about their genetics. We can't really say that much about them. So it's not that much you can use to found mm -hmm. our identity. What it interests, how it would inform my identity is only in the basis of the realization that so much of my identity as an Englishman comes from England as a nation comes from the medieval era when it was founded and the, the medieval ideals of the Normans and the Anglo-Saxons are themselves derived from, uh, you know, earlier Germanic uh, ideals from, from the Germanic tribes and those ideals of the Germanic tribes come from earlier Indo-European ideals mm -hmm. and cultural norms. So in that sense, there's a long continuity. So in, and, and in that sense, that, that uh, reinforces a sense of dignity to my identity to know that it has uh, such heritage and uh, that it goes back so far. But I wouldn't say that um, it's, it, it the, the pitfall could be like focusing too much on stuff that happened too long ago. Um, mm -hmm. You know, their world was centered on cattle. The most important thing on their world was herds of cattle and the man's worth was all about his cows um, and horses and things. And it, even I live with, a, in, there's a field of cows right outside my house right now. I can see them, but I don't really have that much of a connection to those cows. Like I know the guy <laughs> who owns them. I know him. He's a nice bloke. I might have a pint with him every now and then, but I don't. I don't think even he, uh, as a dairy farmer, has that much in common with a seven thousand year old step herder, pastoralist warrior, um, who you know worshipped the Sky Father. No, but you know, so that that's a pitfall. So there's a limit to how much uh, such a such an alien, in a sense, people can really inform the identities of us who generally live urbanized or even if you live in the countryside like me we live suburban or semi-urbanized lifestyles uh i don't work with my hands i don't drive cattle across grasslands mm -hmm. i want to get back a little bit we were talking a little bit about um spirituality and a higher purpose um that we're kind of lacking that in today's culture and you are a practicing pagan can i ask you a little bit that's about right that? i am well, um, that's my religion. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean, like I was just saying, it doesn't mean that what I want to do is go back in time and, mm -hmm. and, and find out exactly what people did 
like I, it's not like I think like the re the correct religion was how the Vikings practiced paganism in the year 950 AD, but or you... the Anglo Saxons practiced it in 450 AD, or whatever. It's it's rather that um, I worship gods that are of the same name as my English ancestors, mm -hmm. and that I recognize. Um, what's rec what's called uh, widely called like perennial philosophy in these days, and what ancient uh, pagan scholars like um, Sallust called the true philosophy. Uh, Celsus called it the true philosophy as well. The, the uh, Neoplatonists mm -hmm. thinkers like this. So Celsus was saying um, he was writing uh, polemics against Christians, who he called Galileans, that all the peoples of the world. Uh, nearly all have their own religions that they've developed, which tend towards the same universal truth. And he said that Christians and Jews didn't, but, but that he preferred Jews to Christians because at least the Jews had traditions of their people, whereas the Christians were people who were abandoning the traditions of their own people mm -hmm. to follow a cult, a, a cult in Eastern Roman Empire, which was even even the Jews didn't like it. So and it and it came out of their uh, as from you know a heretic within their own religion. So his view was that the it didn't matter whether you were an Egyptian, a Greek, a Celt, and he named those three specifically as all different peoples who have uh, that who have come to the true philosophy. Uh, and that uh, same perspective is also uh, is articulated in more com more complex m complicated ways by uh, thinkers of what's called the traditionalist school like René Guénon um in the 1920s you know like 2000 years after Celsus nearly um and it's basically the idea that uh you know the world's big and there's many different people and all of them are trying to understand what the Christians call god or you know what is what Plato called the one the monad um and uh, they do so in ways that are proper to their cultures and to their natures. And so the best way for me, in my opinion, to come to an understanding of the divine is to follow religion in keeping with the practices of my ancestors, the Anglo-Saxons, the English, uh, but not necessarily, it doesn't have to always be exactly the same. So but it's, but it's... obviously- no, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, like, the actual, I studied Anglo-Saxon paganism and Norse paganism at university, and I know a lot about the, what archaeology and the sources reveal about how it was practiced. And the my day-to-day -day religion is not the same religion. I don't claim that it is. Uh, it resembles it, and it would be recognizable to some extent by those people, but they would also see it as very different. I don't make blood sacrifices of animals. Uh, I, you know, on my house altar. I don't, uh, I don't, as I said, I don't own a farm. I don't mm -hmm. have cattle that I can s sacrifice to the gods. So it doesn't make sense for that to happen. But what we see is that those religions that survived that, uh, that haven't been replaced by Christianity, many of them have come from religions, which were when they were more in agriculture societies where people, the, 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 the wealth was measured in cattle. They had cattle sacrifices and then they moved away from that to other things. So like in India, when people make offerings, it's usually fruit, water, um, flowers, things like that. But the Indian religion derives from a, a religion and they, a lot of Indians will claim this isn't true because they find it offensive, but it derives from a religion based on animal sacrifice, the sacrifice of horses and cows. Cows are sacred in India now. It'd be mm -hmm. unthinkable to herd a cow if you're a Hindu, but it did. So obviously these changes happen anyway. So Anglo-Saxon paganism, if it was continued to practice, it would have changed. And it would it suits to some extent the lifestyles that people live. Yeah. But what mustn't change yeah. is the concept of reciprocal offering given exchange between man and gods. And, and that's what I uphold, which yeah. is the ancient way. Because I think a lot of people are scared when they hear the term uh, sacrifice and they obviously right away think of sacrificing a whole animal or something. But I think it was it you who said that it would be like to the equivalent, the modern equivalent be like, you know, like they dressed up in their special garments and they would be like us dressing up in a suit 
and you know sacrificing yeah. maybe champagne or something that is of importance or high value right. to us um yeah I'm, I'm glad you know you, you know you've been listening to me I, uh, yeah i have <laughs> i did say that once i said uh you know the idea is that value the cattle represent value the highest value in their culture so if the, the point of the symbol is like in the original proto-indo-european myth the sky father gives mankind cattle so that they in return can offer the cattle back to him so it's mm -hmm. gift for gift it's back and forth and everything in that early proto-european worldview was based on this idea of give and receive the word for give and take was i think the same word at times and also that's also related to their conceptions of marriage. So like when you marry a woman, there's a give and take with their fat with, between two families. Um, so now we, whatever you're praying for from the gods, what that you, the gods of your people, you are giving some, you want to give something in return. Well, you know, maybe it's champagne is something that's valuable to in our culture. And if you want to look um, respectable, like in Roman times, you know, the, uh, Pontifex Maximus has to dress in a certain way to be respectable, but I'm not going to walk around wearing a toga because it doesn't make any <laughs> sense in our culture. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't fit in. So in order for it to fit in, it needs to fit in our cultural norms, which means dress smartly according to our cultural norms, offer things that have value in our culture. So that's what it means when I say I'm a pagan. Mm. What morals and ethics does paganism teach and where do you derive them from? Well, I, um, the ethics are based, uh, I think there's a problem here with um, the, uh, to be honest, a lot of the pagan religions weren't really religions mm -hmm. and they didn't have a basis on an ethical system. So we can't, I derive a lot of my ethics from the cultural norms of older Indo-European cultures, like Germanic cultures, uh, as, and from my own culture as well, in the Christian times, like, you know, I'm not completely alien to, like, my grandfather's value systems, uh, even though he's from Christian Europe. But um, the idea of religion as this um, set of ideals and values that you learn and that inform the way we behave in society is really a post-christian concept mm -hmm. so it didn't exist in in paganism mm -hmm. where you're talking about roman paganism or viking paganism so though they had ethics and morals and they were very strict about it and they punished those who went against them sometimes with death or torture or quite horrible things but they didn't necessarily claim that the laws that they made came from the gods or that the gods demanded that these laws be made they said they would often argue on the basis that lawmakers make laws now which is that it's for the social good it's for the good of our people that we do this and that you don't do that and therefore we'll punish you for doing it but they except for blasphemy laws which did exist in pagan times most of the laws probably don't derive from a divine source although they would say that good and evil you know like the idea of goodness does however uh there are philosophers of the pagan era particularly greece and Rome, the Gre greco-roman cultures that uh, did have a more, you know, holistic kind of philosophy of uh, of ethics and morals derived from their belief in uh, divinity, and that's what I call Neoplatonism. Uh, the Neoplatonists inform my uh, system of ethics to some extent, because although we can look at, say, that for example, the Norse myths and stuff, and um, we can see some perhaps moral stories be allegories for for moral stories within them the the real insight into i don't think they actually are but for the most part moral stories like the behavior of the gods in the eddas is not exemplary of how for how norse people were supposed to behave at all in, sa in, fa in fact it's sometimes the complete opposite of what they, they considered normal outrageous behaviors in some of them right Exactly. Like when Zeus <laughs> takes on the form of a swan and rapes a woman, that doesn't mean Greek people think that, that that's what you're supposed to do yeah. at all. But they do. You can see uh, get a better idea of what they considered normal and uh, moral behavior by reading the sagas and seeing how who comes afoul of the law, falls afoul of the law, 
and what the law speakers say and how other people talk about other people's behavior. And then you can see they have strict moral codes just like everybody does, but they're not necessarily what the gods do. But the uh, when you read uh, Neoplatonism, you get a, a more a, a deeper and a more considered philosophy of uh, of metaphysics and of uh, of the gods and their nature uh, and um, why it is moral or good to p offer sacrifices to them, and that's called theurgy. That uh, that uh, idea that the sacrifice itself is a moral good, and uh, you know that that uh, that's I'm very influenced by too. Um, because I, you know, if there had been more literate people in uh, Germanic Europe uh, that were pagan, in pagan, you know, and the pagan paganism had continued, mm -hmm. then you would see these kind of philosophies articulated and considered like they were in Greece, but we don't, they weren't. So we can rely on uh, people writing in ancient Greek, um, the Neoplatonists, for, for some of that uh, inspiration. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Christianity is very influenced by Neoplatonism. Uh, well, our Western church is hugely influenced by Greek philosophy of that sort. How could, um, how could a new and revived form of paganism be authentic, organic, accessible and relevant to modern people? Mm. Well, I think that uh, it's just happening. It's kind mm. of been happening now for best part of two centuries where people in two different sort of streams are doing pagan kind of stuff and one of the streams is like the peasant stream which in in, in effect never stopped which is just people normal farm you know like simple people around europe who have continued to uphold traditions and practices that predate christianity and that can be anything from Lithuanian folk songs or uh, and here in, in Devon in Western England, they sing to the apple trees to make them fertile every year. And there's stuff like that all over Europe. You know, you've got stuff like that in Sweden, too, with mm -hmm. um, uh, Albor and stuff like that. But the uh, the the other stream is academics, since especially since the Rena Renaissance, where they start to appreciate the pagan past of Rome and Greece, and then more recently in like Victorian times and in uh, with like in the 19th century in general with like national romanticism, where like nationalistic feeling starts to be expressed with a uh, remembering of the pagan pasts of various parts of Europe, whether that be the Celtic nationalism or whatever, Nordic. Uh, re national romanticism you had a movement there and then you get arts and things like that poets and all kinds of people wagner's operas being you know so heavily influenced by germanic mythology so it's kind of like just happening as a natural current organically in europe uh with the, the coinciding perhaps with the decline of christianity and also as a res as a reaction not against christianity but against industrialization urbanization and the kind of feeling of deracination as people are being torn up from their roots. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about the, the more recent history with the mass migrations of immigrants and stuff, but I just mean like in the last 200 years where many people from countryside have been forced to move to cities or to yeah. factories and, and everything has, you know, the traditional way of life that survived from medieval times was suddenly eliminated, especially in Britain, the first nation to industrialize, but also in other parts of Europe. Yeah, that's very and that's very exciting uh, to see. I've just recently started to interest myself in paganism. I don't know very much about it yet. Um, what would you say to someone who is interested in just learning about these things? Where would they seek information and where would they start? Hmm, that's a good question. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of information out there, and I do think there are quite shockingly large amounts of pagans now compared to when i became a pagan 10 years ago so it's or is it 11 years ago now but it's uh not all the information is very good mm -hmm. unfortunately um and a lot of people are very very concerned with trying to reform other pagans and make them do the right thing but i suppose you can see that in all religions but i'd say it first off know the original know what sources there are on the form of paganism you're practicing 
I'm going to guess, uh, since you're Swedish and your audience is going to be quite a lot of Swedes, that most of the people are going to be interested in Germanic paganism. So in their case, read the Eddas and mm -hmm. learn about it, but also learn about um, the the way that what archaeology reveals about how they um, really practiced. But I'd say that the the most important thing that doesn't matter what kind of paganism you're practicing is that you're doing it for a reason that you want to you you want to have a relationship with the divine you're recognizing that the material world and an understanding of it through science and you know the study of phenomena and uh, observing your surroundings is not sufficient for understanding the phenomena of being itself and that there is something higher now you can't um recognize that which is higher than you, except in a humble way, except mm -hmm. through some kind of humility. So you need to find a way to to express that. And that's what generally is called prayer. So you need to have learn some prayers. I've posted some pagan prayers before. There's only one Germanic pagan prayer that survives properly, although there are other uh, devotive uh, inscriptions which could be called prayers. So, But it doesn't really matter because we know the format for Indo-European prayers. And I've explained that in a video on Indo-European prayer. So you can construct prayers yourself according to the correct format, which is not like a Christian, you know, praying like offhand. You should have a structure mm -hmm. where you 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 call upon a god using epithets, like known epithets relating to their mythological roles, and then you ask for something, and then you make an offering, and then you can. So I think the first thing to do is to learn to do that and to make it a you know something that you. A, a part of your if you don't do it every day at least once a week uh maybe me do it as often as you can see how it makes you feel does it make you feel better try meditation as well though that's that's not strictly speaking uh, a part of european religion but it mm -hmm. uh, it's it works very well and it comes from related indo-european religions in asia in uh, south asia mm -hmm. so prayer is very important and you know whatever you offer i won't tell you what to offer um but you should consider what I've said previously about value, but people usually offer food, alcoholic drinks, um, milk or whatever. I also use in, burn incense, for example, which is not something that is attested among Germanic people, but it's, it's a normal uh, offering. Mm -hmm. In many religions, it was in ancient Rome, they used incense. In India, the Hindus offer incense to the gods. And the religion of my childhood, the Catholic Church, we burned incense in the church. So it's a very natural offering, in my view, which is widely available to burn incense. Mm -hmm. So you can think about what you consider appropriate in, in your own circumstances. But yeah, I'd say the most important thing is to learn about prayer and sacrifice. Thank you. Is there anything, is there anything more you'd like to add before we conclude this interview? Huh. Um, not, not, not especially. I've just like everyone to know that I, um, I, yeah, about my channel, Survive the Jive. I do all these history documentaries on there, um, but I also have collaborated with uh, an uh, animator slash illustrator called Christopher Steininger of Smile Titans. To we made a, 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 a cartoon all about Christmas and the origins of Germanic Christmas and Yule and how it comes from this you know pagan tradition. Uh, it's called the Spirit of Yule. And you can see that for free on YouTube on his channel if you Google the Spirit of Yule. But we also sell it as a graphic novel, which is suitable for children. So if you're thinking, what can I get as a, a kind of a fun cartoon book to explain the pagan origin of Yule, uh, then get a copy of the Spirit of Yule for Christmas for that uh, special someone, please. All right, I can also link it down below as well. And I'll link your channel as well so everyone can go and check that out. Uh, thank you so, thank you so much, much for choosing to be on this, or for agreeing to this interview. It's been very, very fruitful. No, thank you for having me. It's been good talking to you, Jen. I hope everyone enjoyed it. All right, thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this interview. If you liked it, consider subscribing to Tom's YouTube channel, Survive the Jive, to watch his documentaries and videos on European history, Indo-European culture, paganism, and things like that. 
please let me know what you think of these types of interviews and if you would like to see more of it. If you want to support the channel, you can like and share this video or consider donating using the links down below. I want to give a big, special thank you to my Patreons who are Yup, T. Smith, Mark Schwarzberg, John Patrick, Michael Adelius, Craig Nickerson, Jim Hicks, Daniel Yu, Gramer P. Mills, Andrea Springare, Jukja Helgren, Captain Erik Larsson, Helmut Biel, Robert T. O'Gara, Chuck Schaefer, Aiden Finn, Oscar Sandström, Sonja Alriksson, Crowley357, Brennan Bauer, Tobias Schumacher, Adrian Betts, ASDF, ASDF, Are Hågensson, Vyacheslav, Erik Bishop, Tim Bennett, Tony Patak, Liam McCarthy, Patriarchen, Benjamin Dolby, Kasper Öberg, Proud Boy, Steve Olvmoon, John Shiresna, Scott Allen, Benedict Block, Don Lindberg, Jessica Weiner, Villa Nari, Aaron Castile, Dwight Little, Nils Öster, Daniel Brun, Manfred Torstensson, Mr. AOSB, Robin Stahl, Mark Bush Jorgensen, Daniel Gustafsson. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!